tonight we've got Steb Fisher from uh, Melbourne in Australia who um, is going to, I think, uh, be very useful leading a conversation about, about Gaia and other things. Now the way this evening will work is, well firstly to say the event is being live streamed. Uh, it's always hard to tell how many people are following the live stream, um, but um, if you are, then you can use the, the hashtag which we've got, which is hash CCLS2019, to give us, if you've got any questions, when it comes to question time, you may want to join in that conversation and we'll, we'll, we will have those fed in. The plan is that we will uh, have a discussion for 40 minutes or so, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, then we'll have a break and we'll um, have a, a refreshment so that we can perhaps uh, steal ourselves for a discussion. And that discussion will be amongst us all. So the whole thing will be an hour and a half or so. But if you feel you need to leave, uh, then there's no problem. Just, uh, just, um, just go. Um, so my name's Hugh Hunt and I've been uh, running the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series. It's now in its third year. I'm a fellow of Trinity College and I'm in the Department of Engineering and I feel that climate change is, whether we like it or not, um, an engineering problem. It's been created by a lot of the things that we've engineered and quite probably the solutions will involve a lot of engineering. Um, engineering doesn't tend to be talked about a great deal, um, but I think we, we will be uh, talking about engineering increasingly. Um, so Steb Fisher, um, I've known Steb for a long time. He uh, uh, grew up in the, in the UK, um, did a PhD, or you call it a DPhil, don't you? Of in, course. In the other place, <laughs> in chemistry. Uh, worked for BP for, for 10 or 15 yeah. years. Yeah. Um, so you know a little bit about the oil industry. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, uh, ended up in Australia. You've been in Melbourne for 20 25, 25 years. years. Mm. Um, the Australian version of the Tebbit test. Um, well, Steb, which cricket team do you support? Australia. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Most definitely. <laughs> um, and so um, Steb has been recently uh, very concerned about uh, how we're going to uh, survive as a species on this planet for the next few millennia and that's really where Gaia comes in so yeah. what's your take on Gaia? Well you, you just said for the next few millennia I think we've got 10 years but I'll come back to that okay. um, and that you know, I was a bit nervous Gaia uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants don't we I mean to have James Lovelock here two weeks ago, and I think of the Gaia theory um, in the same breath as I think of Einstein and Darwin. I think it's the most profoundly important set of ideas. And in some ways that is the fundamental assumption that I make in trying to answer a, a, a question about how we might survive. And in, in many ways it's how to preserve a working Gaia, something that still functions, holding all the various parts of life together. We kind of think of the, the laws of physics, like the, the temperature at which water freezes, that, that's a, a, a fact. Um, and then perhaps we think of other facts, like the way the economy works. Um, you know, we, we tend to think that that's just the way things work, but you, you like to separate things out into... I do a bit. Um, you know, if you write down the first law of thermodynamics, or the second law, or many other um, theories, they're pretty solid. You, it's hard to change them. But you can write down a new theory of economics in ten minutes on the back of an envelope. Economics is not something that's out there and, you know, measurable in the world, it's a set of ideas that different people have come up with, and so there's no reason why we shouldn't rewrite economics. And economics as we have it now is, is responsible for... 
for a lot of things. Mm. I like to think of it as if you think of planet Earth and the way it works is Gaia and biology and chemistry and geology and ecology and complexity theory and so on. And those are, m with the way we describe them, is almost all um, scientific. They're measurable and you can describe it and it, you know what it's going to do and how it's going to do it. And the way we organize human beings is different. Now, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it didn't matter. Human beings were a relatively small perturbation on this planetary system. But now we cover it all and it's not going too well. The way we organize human beings is politics, economics, largely, and I'd throw in a bit of culture and religion as well, although by and large they're consistent with the working of, of the planet. The problem is that the way we organize human beings has little or nothing in common with the way the planet works. You don't have the first law of thermodynamics in a constitution. If you did put it in constitutions, we'd behave in quite a different way. And if you added the second law, we'd really be kicking goals. So it's quite different. And so it begs the question, how would you reorganize humanity to be consistent with the way the planet works? I mean, it's a bit like if I give you my iPhone and then hand you a chainsaw manual and you don't sort of check that it's a chainsaw manual and you start using it, you pour some fuel in and you pour some oil in and you'll sharp it, sharpen it and you'll wreck it. And that's the way we're operating planet Earth, with the wrong set of operating instructions. So, you know, it's we, we've, got to, we've got to change things quite radically in the way we organize human beings. So we've got to, you were saying 10 years. Where do you get that figure of 10 years from? Oh, well, that's just me being scared. Um, I, you, I wrote something a while ago saying how would we change the way we do things and let's say in a hundred years we'd, we'd fixed it. And the more I'm looking at the evidence coming in about the Arctic, about sea level, about um, plastics, about, well, some person just pressing a button and not away we go, um, the more I think about all of that, I'm just beginning to think that we've got very little time indeed First of all, because I think that something dramatic could happen within the next 10 years. And secondly, even if it doesn't happen, if you step over the cliff, it's a little while before you hit the bottom. And I think that we may have stepped over a number of cliffs, we just haven't hit the bottom yet. So there's the climate cliff. Yeah. But there are other cliffs. Yeah. Which are? Oh. Um, I think the most important one is the biodiversity cliff. I think that ecosystem, I mean, for instance, people have probably heard that the insect populations mm. worldwide are collapsing. The insects do a lot of the heavy lifting in nature. You know, they clean stuff up and they pollinate stuff and so on. They, that, and if they collapse, you know, it's, it won't look very pretty. So I think that there are biodiversity things that are, are really of concern. My partner, Wendy, is a, an ecologist. Um, and she's concerned that lots of people, when they see a population recover, koalas in Victoria, for example, or tigers or whatever, they think that population is now going to be OK. But in fact, that pinch point there is a point where the um, genetic material became very much the same. And as it goes forward, it remains the same and it, that population is then very vulnerable to a disease or something like the Tasmanian devil with occasional cancers. So there's a real problem that many of our species have gone over the edge of the cliff, they just haven't hit the bottom yet. So what, what will we have done in 100 years time to have averted whatever crises we are currently in. Well so, and that's kind of the question that, that y you ask. Yes. That 
we ought to be doing uh, now uh, the uh, things that lead us to a successful end. Yes. I think, uh, I mean, what I'm interested in is if we look at a problem and try and fix it now, um, first of all, we may not fix it, and secondly, we may just argue about it endlessly and never actually get into action. So what I set out to do when I asked this question of how would you reorganise human beings, what are the principles you'd use, is to say, well, if we fixed it, what, what did it look like as we started on that journey and what principles did we use? So by fixing it, what I mean is we've dealt with carbon in the atmosphere and the climate is now stabilised, um, both through engineering but also through managing carbon. Um, what have we done to rebuild our soils? There's every chance our soils will simply run out within 60 years and then we won't be able to grow anything. What are we going to do with our fresh water? Many of our, ri the, the Darling River in Australia has just run dry. Um, what are we going to do with forests? We're still in Victoria chopping down old growth forest. And not only are we doing it, but the government is doing it. It's a government owned company that's doing it. It's madness. What are we doing about um, our consumption of material and our destruction of habitat? What are we doing about biodiversity? So if you turn it around and say, well, we've dealt with all of those issues and we're living in a world where we've done the best we could. So biodiversity won't bounce back because that takes millions of years. It'll, it'll have stabilised. Um, sea level won't just stop rising. It'll take some hundreds of years for that to stop. But we'll have, you know, we'll have stabilised the system. And the question then is, OK, if the world was to look like that, what would human beings look like? How would they be behaving? How would they be organising themselves? So, what are the, what's the rule book, as it were, for setting it, setting yeah. in, in train that behaviour, those behaviours? And this is, I mean, and I, I hope I'm going to get a bit of help later. Part of the reason for coming here was that I framed the question and I wrote down some answers for myself, but they're based on my experience. And one of the problems with an individual looking at, um, I don't know whether people are familiar with wicked problems when you've got a co problem that's so complex that it can't be solved, it just it morphs into a new problem. One of the problems with that is you, you can't do it from one perspective, you need multiple perspectives. So I'm hoping for a bit of help later. And um, so I wrote down a few things. So number one assumption was that um, we, th what we were going to do would be science-based. So you start writing scientific principles down into a constitution. Why do you say it should be science-based? What, what's because that's the way the world works. In other words, reality-based. So that the water freezes at zero, and that's science. Exactly, okay. exactly. And there's no point in somebody coming out with a new act of parliament which contradicts um, our understanding of ecology or biodiversity or the first law of thermodynamics or, or anything else. So. So let's put those in the Constitution, not sort of buried deep somewhere in some subclause, but up front in the preamble. We deal with reality. We deal with evidence. So that politics, would be... We see a lot of politics now that doesn't tend to be grounded in science. And yes. <laughs> is that because the science is in some sense uncertain or because it's um, that politicians don't know about science or that science is not well respected in our society or what's what i think there are multiple reasons first of all lots of politicians don't know anything about science they're trained um in different areas but mostly not science um secondly their interests um in a competitive system are to be in power and that's got nothing to do with science science gets in the way well it certainly does, yes. So, so that, that's, I mean, and you were saying, if, is the science not certain? Well, there's a very good principle called the precautionary principle, which is not to do anything unless you've proved that it's safe for the people and for the environment. But we don't follow the precautionary principle, we follow the money principle, um, which is to make as much money as we can as quickly as we can. And that is almost always in conflict with the precautionary principle. So even if the science is uncertain, 
you know, you still use it to guide you. Okay, so we're grounding our constitution yeah. in science. That's yes. the number one. Yeah. And then I think there are two other pieces. One is, when coming back to Gaia, is that um, the fundamental unit, um, if you like, of the environment is an ecosystem. Um, and often they're, they're contained. We have a concept in Victoria called an ecological vegetation class, where a group of plants and a group of animals and a group of insects and a group of fungi all work together quite well to form a stable system. Now, if that's the fundamental unit of the environment of, of the ecosystem of Gaia, then the fundamental unit of humanity is probably the community, you know, probably not much more than 5,000 people, maybe less, that has stewardship over that system. They're local. And I sort of hold that only the people who live in a particular place can ever know it well enough to be stewards of that place. What it means is ultimate political authority has to be local. It has to be built around ecosystems. And so there's a, a fundamental principle which turns our system of government upside down. It says, you know, somebody in New York mustn't be making decisions about, you know, a swamp in Australia. It's the people who live there that m make those decisions because they're interested in the indefinite well-being of that e ecosystem. They're interested um, in how it works. Um, they care about it. And um, it's uh, that they know about it is the most important thing. They and do they also know about the science? I mean, I kind of think that this community well, that, that might yeah. not be terribly well grounded Nowadays, in they don't because um, even in sort of local rural con communities, they're still all on Facebook and pressing buttons and switching air conditioning on and so on. So they've lost touch with those ecosystems. The place that places that still, I mean, Wendy and I do a lot of work in Nepal, and they do have a very fundamental connection with their ecosystems and still understand them and the way they work and take care of them quite well. It sounds as if this is how it all was when the global population was much smaller. So can yeah. this work with a, a population as large as we have now? Or are we necessarily saying that the world's population has to reduce? Mm. I do think it has to reduce um, dramatically. And if it reduces in a collapse, whether it be war or famine or flood or drought or whatever, I don't think the ecosystems will do very well. So what I'm interested in is that if the population does go up, probably by another 25%, that somehow we must manage to get through that point and let it start drifting down the other side without collapse. And, and so one of the next fundamental principles that I think is important is that if you're out in a, on a boat in the middle of the ocean with no prospect of making landfall, and um, would you organize a cooperative system of governance on the boat or a competitive one? And we are out in the middle of the universe on a boat, a spaceship, um, and um, we now need to switch from competitive systems of organizing human beings Economics is competitive, politics is competitive, sadly religion is competitive, um, and cultures can be, although they don't need to be, but, but we need to make a transition from competition in governance to cooperation. And that's quite a profound shift. It's why when you said it was an engineering problem, yes it is, and a chemical problem, and oh, this, that problem, and, and so on, but it's actually a spiritual problem for us to be competitive and let go of all our hatreds and resentments and so on is a spiritual challenge. And so um, 
while I haven't written anything down about that, unless we learn to behave um, as if we care about each other, more than that, unless we actually care about each other, we're not going to sort this out. So the ancient civilizations, Romans, Greeks, mm-hmm. and so on, they were pretty competitive and pretty, you know, they, they, their, their destiny was as a result of, of their greed and, and competitiveness? Yes. And, and is it in the, the Romans' case, it was simply they couldn't grow enough grain to keep, grain was their main source of energy, they couldn't grow enough grain to keep their systems going. So they ran out of their space. Mm. They outgrew their space. We're outgrowing our space. Well, the thing about the Romans and the Greeks and the Mesopotamians and, and everybody else is they may have wrecked their local environment and gone into the Dark Ages or whatever it was, but they didn't wreck the whole planet. Um, so they were essentially, to all intents and purposes, in an open system. Um, the planet was so big and humanity was so small that it didn't matter too much. Unfortunately, now it does. Climate change is not a local Roman problem. It's a global problem. So we've got a couple of principles. We've got our constitution is grounded in science and mm-hmm. that we need to have a compassionate empathetic empathic I think that's the word (laughs) empathic (laughs) um, uh, mode of governance globally empathic we're going to need to cooperate globally you can't have one country burning tons of coal and spewing out CO2 if it's to the detriment of everybody else so thinking about getting from where we are now to where we need to be in a hundred years time yeah what is another what are our, what's in our rule book, and then we can, in a minute, once we've got a few of our rules, then we can think about how we implement these rules. So there's science and cooperation and taking care of local ecosystems and having systems of governance which support local communities, highly educated local communities, okay, that, and that's not what we necessarily have now because our political systems have tried to um, dumb down our populations. So I think that that's a, a, a problem. I'm, there are economic ones which I think are really important. If you introduce cane toads into Australia and there's no defence against them, they kill um, all the other animals, not by aggression but passively. Um, and the same with cats and foxes and you know, rabbits. Rabbits, rabbits. And um, what we've never quite learned, I think, is that if you introduce a new product into a community, a country, that completely makes the, the, uh, the, the local product obsolete overnight, it causes a real problem because it really damages the community, it wipes out their livelihood, it, it, you know, it's... Okay, we see a lot of that. Well, um, so if you're to have stable local communities which grow gradually and learn to use new technologies or whatever it is, they can't afford to have something that comes and crushes them economically because they can't compete. So although for the last however long um, economic theory has said um, global trade, free trade all over the world, I actually don't think that that's a very good idea. I think that they need, uh, it's a bit like if, if, you, if you've got a bottle of concentrated fuming sulfuric acid, um, it's really useful if it's kept in the container and just used judiciously on a few experiments. <coughs> but if you let it out, it'll just eat everything it touches. And global trade is a bit like that. It's eating communities and <coughs> So I actually think that what we need to do is work out how to make communities relatively self-sufficient and have quite careful trade boundaries, just like there are ecological boundaries, or there were, to (coughs) keep those ecosystems of, of humanity 
safe and protected. So and that allow new technologies in slowly so that people have time to adapt. So we're not Transition talking is, about, is important. We're not talking about some sort of isolation, commu isolated community. No, not at all. Because we've got this global. No. We are global. No. We can't undo that. No. Um, well, I can't grow nutmeg on my little farm. And I like nutmeg, so I want somebody to be able to sell it to me. So, you know, sure, there are important things. But if, if we had something similar growing in my local area and it was going to put them out of business because nutmeg came in too cheaply, I'd forego that pleasure so that we could work something out over time that worked for the producers who depend on it. So one of the things that we learnt from Jonathan Poor in his CCLS lecture was that there are things that are made in different places, in different countries. Mm. Um, and some of those things are very expensive and very damaging to be made in a certain place because they consume a lot of water or they consume, they generate a lot of CO2 or they, they <coughs> cause local environmental damage. Mm. That same product produced somewhere else is much less damaging. One thing we don't know when we go and buy something in a, in a shop is that, well, does this tin of whatever it is come from a nice, good, sustainable place or does it come from a less sustainable place? So the information is hard to find. It is, and that's why I think trade has probably got to um, drop dramatically. There's a calculation which is quite easy to do. Um, at the moment, we use about 1.4, 1.5 planets worth, I think it might be even up to 1.7 now, um, from the Global Footprint Network. Um, we use 1.5 planets worth of regenerated material each w year. In other words, we're eating into capital each year beyond about, is it August the 1st now, I think, is, is overshoot day? Everything that we consume beyond August the 1st is not going to be regenerated the next year. So in order to come back into balance, we're going to, and now I'm talking about forests and fish and soils and so on. In order to come back into balance, we immediately need to um, pull back by about 40% in consumption worldwide. We're going to have about another 25% in our global population. So to feed and clothe and house the newborns, we need to pull back another 25%. How much of that is wastage, though, rather than...? Well, that's... Um, can I come back to that? Yeah. Um, then I find it, without any moral justification, extraordinary, that we allow um, there to be a gap of 40 to 1 in wealth and income between the top 20% of people and the bottom 20% of people. So suppose we said that we'll raise the bottom 20% from one unit up to four units, and we drop the top 20% from 40 units down to 10. Now the gap is four to 10, which is two and a half, which is not fair, but it's a lot better than it is now. So we'd need to pull back, the rich countries would need to pull back by another um, 75%, factor of four. And then finally, in it, any system, when you build a bridge, you don't build it to be exactly the right strength, you build it to be twice as strong. So you want some resilience in the system. So you, you, um, with, you reduce consumption by another um, factor of two. When you put all those factors together, it means the rich countries need to reduce their consumption by a factor of 16. Now, that's a back-of-the-envelope cal calculation, and we'll get clever with wastage and all sorts of things. Maybe it's a factor of 10, but it means that we in Australia, here in Britain, in America, in Europe, need to find ways to reduce our consumption by a factor of 10 to survive. So... Um the time scale of 10 years, is this a 10 years bef before by which time we have to have started this or it has to be in place? I think we're 40 years too late starting, but look, it, it, it's 10 years not in that there's any calculation you can do because these systems are 
complex and unstable, and they might tip over tomorrow, and they might tip over in 20 years' time. So you just don't know when they're going to go. But the prudent thing is to go flat out as if it's an emergency, because I think it is the, the, the right climate, now. The, we've heard quite a lot of stuff about climate recently, yeah. and the climate, the climate tipping point is reckoned to be 10, 12 years. I mean, this, if we're going to have any yeah. chance of meeting the yeah. Paris two degree target, mm -hmm. we have to have put in place dramatic changes to our energy use within the next 10 years. I mean, seriously dramatic. Um, so we're unlikely to meet these targets. Does that mean it's well it is going to be a disaster? Or how do we... No, I mean, d thank goodness we know nothing about the future. Um, <laughs> And, um, and we never will, or at least I don't think so. But um, so I'm not saying anything's going to happen by a particular time. I'm just saying that it would be really smart to get on with it now. And we've shown in the past that when faced with a crisis, unfortunately usually in wartime, and that's not the ideal analogy, but, but in wartime we've done extraordinary things incredibly quickly. Um, so... We, I know that if we all decided to do it, we probably could. It's just a question of deciding to do it. And as, our, um, <laughs> as, as Mr. Tusk said the other day, our friends I in Britain, um, if our friends in Parliament <laughs> can't decide what to do, you know, we've got a bit of a problem. So we've got to, we've got to try and figure out how to get this new constitution working. Mm -hmm. So do you, um, do you have a, a, a vision for how we do that? Does it happen from, as they say, from the bottom up, or is there a top down? Do we, do we have to have a very radical change? Um, and if so, how do we do it? Or do we, as individuals, create a change? And I guess that's... That's a hard thing for all of us because we we, I think the answer we, is we have these discussions because we want to do something. The answer is yes, all of the above. I, I mean, if you um, look at how complex systems make fundamental changes, it usually goes through a chaotic phase when there's a collapse of the old system and then the new one emerges and grows from, in the case of, bushfires in Australia, the ashes of what was there before. Um, the problem with that is, in human terms, that is very messy, and we don't tend to behave very well when things collapse. So alongside that, I mean, I, I do some wonderful work with an organisation called More to Life, where we work on how we deal with um, resentments. We work on how we deal with the way we see the world and I think and it's essentially um, well it's spiritual work in the sense of um, let's be in touch with reality a, as it is. I don't mean in any religious sense. I mean just what is going on right now and I think that that, <coughs> that work needs to go along alongside all the other things that are going on, like, for example, your wonderful SPICE project of injecting particles up into the upper atmosphere. All of those things need to happen together. There are lots of physical things, but there's this deep transformation. And then I think many of our systems will need to collapse. I mean, I don't think representative democracy can possibly exist in this new world. Mm. I don't think because I don't think representative democracy is either representative um, or democratic, um, which is a problem if that's its name. Um, we need to come up with something that's much more in tune um, by the people, for the people, of the people. Um, so if you think of things that have been successful hmm. in recent years, like everybody now has got a mobile phone in their pockets, yep. um, and it's transformed the way we the way we do things, the way we think about things. And people have received these, this technology willingly. Um, and do you see a, a way where we can make radical change? I mean, that has been a radical change in the way mm. we 
communicate and the way we receive information. Can we make radical changes that we will all willingly and with excitement accept, but that go along the route that we need to be going along? Was that wishful thinking? I, I started from what's it going to look like and what do we know are the necessary conditions for this to happen? And I haven't talked that much about how we get there. Right. Um, and that's partly because I have some ideas of some of the things we might do to get there, but in the end it will be our collective approach to it that actually makes that happen. So it's, you know, I, mean I often hear people say to me, well, that's not going to happen. And I look at them and say, yeah, it doesn't look too likely, does it? And yet, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. You know, if you put a gun to somebody's head and say, you're going to die unless, they will probably do whatever the unless is. But this gun is amorphous and out there and we don't know what it is and, and so on. So it's much more difficult to get the sort of change we want. And, uh, and yet, it's not looking very promising the way we're going. So how do we, and I think it's much more about um, painting a, an attractive vision of the future and giving people an experience of what that future might be and what it's like to be, you know, with people that you enjoy and you connect with and you, you love. I think that that's the way, that looking at the problems, I've looked at the problems and they make me very depressed. So I tend to try and s keep with the, the potential solutions. So I've been asked, sorry. sorry, well I've been asked to do a project in Gippsland, which is the area east of Melbourne in Victoria, uh, looking at, um, we haven't got the, the money yet, but we'll, we'll see. Um, looking at how Gippslanders might adapt <coughs> to it, uh, to climate change in particular. And what I'm interested in is creating a process which excites and enthuses people to start doing the things that are necessary, rather than say, oh well, this year the apples, and this is true, the apples on our apple tree cooked on the tree. They were baked apples. Um, because it was too hot. And so, you know, there's the problem, but what are we going to do? Well, well, for a few years, we're probably going to have to grow oranges instead of apples. Maybe it'll cool off a bit later, but um, right now, we need to adapt. And, but how do you get people excited about that and enthused about that and caring about each other? Because in the end, even if it all does end in tears, It'd be nicer to do it caring about each other than not caring about each other. So one of the, um, the things that we think a lot about in Cambridge is that it's a relatively small city mm -hmm. and we often think there'll be many people here who have been thinking about this, that if these types of things are going to work anywhere, mm -hmm. then they, we ought to be able to make them work here in Cambridge. And I think that one of the things we should talk about after we have our break is what initiatives are going on in Cambridge and what, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what things that we're trying to do here that, we're just, that are just not working. We ought, for instance, it's a, it's a flat city, it ought to be easy to, for bicycle infrastructure to be just wonderful here. But that, even that's hard work. Mm -hmm. So we find even the simplest things are hard work. So how do we, how do we make the harder things not hard Easier. Or, or is it automatic that once we start dealing with the simpler things, the harder things? No. You know, that's, that's perhaps something we can talk about. It isn't automatic, on. I don't think. And I think it takes extraordinary leadership and and structures which allow that leadership to lead and, and to have autonomy. And I don't imagine, is there a mayor of Cambridge? Yes. Or a, yeah. I'd be surprised if he or she has much latitude to make dramatic changes. I don't know, but um, 
So let's, let's uh, we'll, we'll wind up in the next few minutes before we'll have a refreshment. Mm. Let's perhaps now lay in, uh, put in place some, some of the questions that you would really like to feed out to yeah. the audience and we can get yeah. feedback on particular questions, the ones that you would like to have a good discussion on. So what would mm. they be then? Well, there's an immediate question of, are you willing? You know, I, do you want to go on the way you're going and then just it falls off the edge? But the people who come or here you are want to willing. But I what don't know. I don't know. What I, about I don't think I want to make any assumptions about okay. anybody. I think, I, and, and it also, although we sometimes think we're willing, there are pieces of us that still do things the old way. I'm not, you know, I still burn wood in our fire, um, even though we have a very sustainable house. I still generate some CO2. So what, how, how do I express that willingness in the world? Uh, am I willing to, to share, basically, and, and so on? So that's one question. Then the other question is ideas about how we organise ourselves locally. There's a most wonderful article, <coughs> where it was actually a talk on radio in Australia um, by a man called Nick Sharp, I think, who was a planner who sat down and said, what would a sustainable uh, town or city look like? And he came up with about 5,000 people um, and, you know, that it starts with schools and shops and um, doctors and so on, and, uh, and then it goes out to residential, and then food, and then fibre, you know, as their local ecosystem which supports them. And the size of the community was very important, and it was built around the bicycle, um, amongst other things. So what communities are you willing and, and interested to live in, and how might you create those? Um, so that would be a w another question. So I think we're, we're constrained when Cambridge is um, 100,000 plus, what are we now, 200 and something? But it depends on whether all the students are here or not. But yeah. actually Cambridge, the, what is the population of Cambridge? Because there are many villages hmm. and people are coming in from a, from a, a long way away. So for, for that to change here would be quite difficult. It's all going to be quite it's difficult. All be quite <laughs> difficult. <laughs> um, and it won't be at all difficult if we do it together. It's amazing how if people have a common purpose and a willingness to help each other, how difficult things actually become exciting and challenging and fun. And it, in fact, I suspect we won't get through to the other side unless it's exciting and challenging and fun. So the fun side of it is important because we do want to, I, I guess that's one of the things that we all find um, rather depressing is that talking about climate change and, and what's going to happen in the future yeah. isn't fun. It doesn't uh, look like it. But we've got to make, we've got to, be, we've got to be optimistic. It's got to be made, we've got to know that the things we are doing are positive and beneficial. The thing about pessimism is it, it almost guarantees that you're going to get what you're <coughs> afraid of. Right. Because you go around the place and you don't have any energy to do anything and so on. But if you're optimistic and you can see a rosy future, you've got the energy and the excitement yep. and the connection with others that can make it happen. Well, that's one of the things that Ro Randall was saying to us yeah. again just yeah. a few weeks ago, that we want to, to try and keep the, the upward spiral rather than the downward spiral. Yeah. That Absolutely. we've got to be, as soon as we get into a, oh God, isn't it depressing? Yeah. Let me buy you another beer. Yeah. Um, that happens too easily. Hmm. On the subject of which, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we will, we will take a break and it would allow people time to think a little bit about what they would like to have in a discussion. The purpose of the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series has always been to um, have uh, things being said and then having a discussion afterwards. And what we've done in other lectures is we've had a break and then we mingle around and we have informal discussion. But this, this discussion might be just a little bit more formal than this. Um, 
Thank you very much, Steb, for that uh, little chat. And um, let's uh, thank you, Steb, and then we'll have a break. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.